thank you for your attention in advance. Um, the title of my talk is a little bit different than what's in the program, but the, the spirit is the same, and the idea is to just talk a little bit about some of the common problems that are encountered in using glass colors, and uh, I'm going to go through these uh, four different uh, uh, topics, basically. Uh, glass color anatomy, uh, the process in a nutshell, what some of the common problems are, and, and I realize that in many cases, in all cases, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, people who are decorators, you guys do this every day. Uh, you know, Fusion Ceramics is not a decorator, and, and we don't aspire to be one to compete with our customers, but um, but we do, uh, through your experience and working with our customers, have experienced a lot of these problems vicariously. And so we just want to give you some uh, suggestions, maybe a slightly different way of looking at some of these things. So common problems. Sometimes these are called recycle problems. They keep coming back around again, they're recurrent. And, um, these uh, uh, issues come up when the production conditions are right, and I have that in quotes because really it's when conduct, uh, production conditions are wrong. You know, you have a stacking tolerance, you, you just have a set of conditions uh, that, that push you over the edge. Um, so these problems come and go, and, but they don't stay solved because the decorating environment is conceptually very simple. You put stuff on the glass or ceramics, you put it through an oven, and it fires, everything's good. But it's, there's a lot of complicated stuff going on there in terms of the timing of that process and, and steps that you take uh, during the uh, um, decorating process and during the firing process uh, will determine whether you go over that edge or not. So sometimes these common problems that are recurrent uh, take place because, and we notice them because there's how efficient a process can be, you know, it's ultimate where it is possible to be at. And sometimes we try to run it past that, because we'd like it to go faster. So first of all, now we have the glass color. Um, so glass fritz are the majority component of, a, of what we're calling glass color. This would be a ready to screen product you know, from a can. Uh, 80 to 95 weight percent typically of, of the solids in there are the powder, um, or of the powder is uh, the glass frit. This is acting as a high temperature glue. So that's what actually bonds to your substrate, whether it's glass or ceramic or the glaze on a ceramic. Uh, it, it has an optical role. It's supposed to be transparent and it holds the pigment colors in place so that light can come in and interact with those colors and then come back out to your eye. Um, it also determines the gloss, of course. And um, the glass, because it's such a large percentage of, your, um, uh, of what's on the decoration when you're done firing it, it is primarily determining the chemical and mechanical durability of that decoration. So pigments are very important because they give you the color, um, and those are typically five to 20 weight percent of the solids, sometimes called the powder. And usually you're using more than one pigment. Um, there's a blend, and sometimes there are some other fillers that are put in there to adjust your color and or your texture. Because not every decoration is a nice glossy gloss. Sometimes people want a semi-matte or a satin or something that looks more like chalkboard. Um, pigments can play a minor role in the, the chemical and mechanical durability. And then finally, we have the organic medium, which is what is used, it's necessary to allow you to transfer the powders or the solids to the surface. And typically, that's 10 to 28 percent of the total weight of a, of a ready-to-use product. Um, I guess the, the most important thing I wanted to point out here is that the organic medium is temporary. It's going to be removed. And that's a key part of a lot of the problems that come about during the process. Um, it's very important, obviously, for the, uh, how you are transferring the powders to the surface. So the important properties include viscosity, surface tension, which we heard a little bit about in the previous uh, presentation, uh, also burnout behavior. and. Um, some typical mediums would be ones that are based on oil. There are others that are water miscible, maybe based on uh, alcoholic or other uh, types of water miscible um, solvents. And then there's thermoplastic, which is more like a, a wax, a crayon even, is how some people describe them. So if we look at, um, again, glass color is equal to a powder plus the medium, and the powder is equal to frit plus the pigment. That's about as simple as, as we can make it. Um, comes to you in a can if it's a, if it's a paste. Um, and if we look down microscopically at that, most of these particles are very small. They're not in a nanometer size, um, like the, uh, uh, the surface uh, profile in the previous talk, but they're, they're small. They're less than the diameter of your hair, 20 microns. Um, and you'll notice that when it's mixed up properly, you've got medium 
coding in between all the particles. You don't have clusters of particles stuck together. The medium is in between all of them. So if we look at the process in a nutshell, the first step is to transfer this decoration to the workpiece, and it can be done in many ways. There was a, uh, a great talk earlier by Sean that talked about different uh, methods or mechanisms for doing that, and it can include screening, spraying, roll coating, and decals. And those of you that use decals and make decals know that we could have a whole weekend-long symposium on decals, and so I'm not going to try to go into all that, but just to say this is, this is sort of a summary of that. Viscosity and surface tension are always key properties, whether you're talking about uh, those first three uh, uh, processes there that use uh, a wet or a liquid uh, um, glass color, or when you're printing the decals, obviously, those are important properties. So the next step would be drying or the burnout. When you do that in the preheat zone of the, of the furnace, the objective there is to vaporize the medium. And it's important to, I guess at this point, make sure that you're always aware that the decoration and wear absorb heat based on their mass. And people who do decorations know that, you know, the, the big growler going through is going to fire differently than a shot glass. Um, the process takes time. The vaporized medium must be removed. It's not enough to just burn it off of the surface and out of the decoration. You have to get it out of the vicinity or it's going to cause problems. So if we look at this nice little microstructure, microstructure in motion. You have the wet applied film, and then there's this drying and burnout step. And, and you'll notice that the arrows and the vapor is coming off the top of the decoration, which makes sense, I guess, intrinsically you think about it. But this, this very simple um, concept, this drawing, this is key to understanding a lot of the problems that come up in firing decorations. The substrate is cold the top of the decoration is hot. And once you get the medium out of there, you have to remove it, right? So you gotta get it out. The third step in the process, which is really intimately linked to the second step, because it's in the same you know, piece of equipment typically, is you need to fully fire the glass color to get its final properties, to get the best properties you can get out of that formula on your product. So in that process, you're eliminating pores, you're trying to maximize gloss, if it's a glossy formula, you want to get a good bond to the substrate, and you develop the color. Um, complete burnout is required to get the best fire results. So again, like I said, it's, the process looks very simple, conceptually very simple process. So we have the first two stages, the third stage, and I didn't point out, but in the second part, you see that there's a slight shrinkage because you're losing liquid and, and you're removing it, its volume from that mix, and you're left with these pores because at, at the dry out, the drying temperatures, the burnout temperatures, you know, the glass particles are still solids and they don't fit together nicely, so there's all these voids between them. After firing, ultimately, what you would like to have is a, continu a, a continuous layer of glass of the frit that was in that decoration holding the pigment particles there without voids, without you know any kind of interfaces there. That's the ultimate goal. And so and sometimes that could be called consolidation. So if we start looking at some of the pitfalls in a in a wet product, and some folks buy thermoplastics, uh, which don't change over time. There are people that are probably are using 25 or 35 year old <laughs> thermoplastics. Um, in a liquid medium, they settle over time because of the density difference. So if, if that settled product is not, if you're not careful to reintroduce, the, you know, if you're not stir it back together properly and get everything mixed and uniform, you can have a, a different viscosity than what you're expecting because you're going to have a different density. You have a, a thin material on top and thick material on bottom. The fire properties could include thin prints. The color could be different. Um, we recommend you rotate stock, flip containers, redisperse prior to use if you're going to hold on to the material for a long time. If it's kept uh, tightly in the container, a wet paste can last for many years, actually. Now here's a good one, and it ties in really nicely with the previous talk. Um, surface contamination or surface energies. Um, there are many different sources of surface contamination, and, and ceramic or glass enamels tend to be less uh, susceptible to problems maybe than organic 
coating is due when it comes to certain types of surface contamination because you're burning them off at high temperature. But some of these, uh, you know, dust, oil can get on there, and not just the, the cold end coatings that people intend uh, from the manufacturing process, but just from storage and handling. You can get things on there. Schmutz, it's a very scientific term. It just means stuff we haven't defined, but it still causes us trouble. Um, so, you know, surface contamination can lead to pinholes, sagging, uh, it can screw up your print, you can get creep. There, I think every decorator's probably got 15 different terms they use to describe, hey, this is what happens when it looks like this, we call it, you know, creep. Um, be aware and check for the contamination. Um, and a lot of you uh, probably, I mean, I'm sure you all know that, but it's important to, to sort of remember it from time to time. Pre-firing, where if you have a situation where you have a lot of contamination, it may fix the problem. Uh, depending on what the contamination is, it may not. And finally, uh, uh, or not finally, it's the third uh, point on this slide, is viscosity control. Viscosity control is very, uh, very important. Particularly, um, uh, you know, you can run into smearing, you can get um, running, runs, if your viscosity of your spray is too, too low. You can have pick off if your viscosity and temperature of your, if you're doing multicolor uh, thermoplastics, you know, you come over the next layer and pick off what you just put on. Um, viscosity is influenced by temperature. And so the question to ask yourself if you're having any problems in your production, one of the first ones is, is your, is your viscosity and temperature consistent? Because this is a, one of the primary variations that we see. Screen temperature for thermoplastics in particular, you've got the setting that you use to, to control the process, but what does that actually mean in terms of temperature? Um, how uniform is it? You can have a 50 degree difference from one side of the screen to the other. That could cause a big problem. And also airflow and other uh, external events that you may not be thinking about could affect, can, can influence it. And, um, just looking at, uh, this is a very complicated uh, thermoplastic uh, screen print design. It was sort of a wrap. And Hopefully it came through. We can see areas where it just didn't didn't transfer properly. And um, looking at that process, working with the customer, um, it turns out that there was just a slight difference in viscosity. It, you know, the, when we make materials, and I, I mentioned, I showed that there were at the beginning that these formulas have a range to the amount of pigment and the amount of glass for it and the amount of medium. And to, sometimes to get a, a particular color that you want under your firing conditions, that's going to be a little bit higher viscosity, right? Maybe we have to put more pigment in there and less medium to get you the look that you want. So in this particular case, there was an issue with screen temperature. You know, the setting was the same as always, but the screen was starting to get old and there was a spot in it that was cold. Um, the, there was also a fan because it was kind of hot and the fan was blowing across that station drop in the temperature. And then finally, there was a refilling procedure. Being a thermoplastic and running long runs, you know, you, most people don't have auto feeds, so they keep it hot over here and keep it hot. Just as simple as stirring it up and not pulling the material just from the top. Pull it, stir it up, and then pull it from the pot and refill. Now you've, you've made that, that temperature control more uniform. You think about a pot sitting on a hot plate, the hottest part is the bottom. The coldest part is the top. If you pull ink from the top one time and pull it from the bottom the next time, it's not the same temperature. So just some simple things like that caused a problem that was, at first blush, difficult to fix. <clears throat> so, and I don't want to hit this too hard, but I did want to emphasize it a little bit. Adding medium, there are certainly legitimate times to add medium to an incoming product. You you may use it under a multitude of, of conditions, different products, different speeds, you know, different you know, size decorations. So there's certainly reasons to buy one product and then maybe modify it a little bit by adding medium. But if you're doing it, just be careful that, that you're doing it consistently um, and that you're not unintentionally introducing another variable that could really affect your, your, uh, your printing. And finally, like I mentioned, it's, a, it's conceptually simple, but a very complicated process, actually. There are dozens of trade-offs in this process. You know, gloss versus opacity, meaning if I, I want to you know, have a really dark print, really opaque print, um, 
then I may have to up the, the pigment content to, to meet your color requirement. That may affect loss. So in all of these, uh, you know, color intensity versus mesh count, durability versus firing temperature, you may have a limitation that, that fixes where, how far you can go in one direction, an engineering trade-off, basically. So factors affecting the burnout. Burnout requires sufficient heat and, and airflow. This starts about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat is the thermal energy. We measure temperature, which is a measure of how much heat is there, and heat moves from a hot source to a cool source over time. Simple concepts, but sometimes it's, it's easy to get caught up in the, in the, in the, in the fight on the floor. Um, the air is actually what heats up the wear, and it also removes the medium, the vapor. It takes it out of, the, out of the zone where it can cause trouble. You have to account for the, the heat capacity and the heat flow. So if you have a moving product, you, you have a product on a belt, in most cases, moving through a rear. So you have a basically a heat battery there, a density that has to be heated up, an amount of material, and it's moving at some speed. So if you have more mass, you have to put more heat into it, right, per unit time. The trouble is sometimes that means that you need to increase your furnace temperature maybe a little bit. And, and I'll point out, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more in a second. So where spacing alters the airflow, which alters the heat. Uh, temp the temperature rises first on the surfaces. There's a gradient between the top of the decoration and the part of the decoration touching the glassware. Um, the part of the decoration touching the substrate, the bottom part, is the coldest. It's the one that heats up the glass. So it's these temperature differences that define how fast your process can go, the potential. So some burnout uh, pitfalls, the goal again, you want to remove medium before the frit softens. Consolidation, which is where the frit starts softening and you start eliminating those pores, it, it begins about 900 Fahrenheit in most of these systems. The surface of the decoration heats first. So what happens is you can close off the escape routes for your vapor. The vapor has to go out through those pores there's gaps between the solid particles. And if the particles start to soften, and they start softening at the top, no escape. At least not at that point. So that trapped medium can really mess up your fire appearance. You can form bubbles, pinholes, blisters during this firing step. You can get something that, that uh, we call washout, where you see the, surf the first surface. So in this particular instance, you have these micro pinholes and in a white layer, you're actually seeing the glass color shift through, so it's not as opaque a white. And in the green layer, you're seeing a white shift through, so it's not as dark a green. So it's washing out the color. This can also affect your durability because you're increasing the surface area of the decoration that's exposed to some type of chemical attack. And you're also making it prone to mechanical durability issues because now you've got something that's porous and it's not bonded as well to the substrate. Um, you can also, that also will lower the gloss. The gloss of that product would be lower than what ideally it would be, and it cre increases the texture. So here's a couple of examples of blisters. And um, so in the, in the one case on the left, you can see the, the blue layer, which is printed on top of the white layer, is blistered. The white layer looks pretty good. And the red layer looks pretty good. So what you have is a, a failure to manage that burnout process. You trap medium. And then when it was able to get out, it was pushing out against this molten glass and it created a blister, little bubbles. <clears throat> Same thing is true on the right side. And you, you see this a lot with multi-layers, which makes sense. It's more complicated. You have to get everything burnt out of the lowest layer, the one that's in contact with the glass, before you start sealing off the escape routes in the top layer. So it's that temperature difference and managing that that allows you to avoid this kind of problem. And I remember I mentioned you need to remove the vapor. If you don't remove the vapor, it's still there and it can get on the wear. So you can see some sagging effects, sometimes called weeping, uh, things that can mess up your, your, your design. Um, 
And also what it does is it adds heat capacity back in. So you, you, you spent energy to get that stuff burned out of there. And then somehow it's condensing back on your wear. And now it has to be blown off again in order to, to not have problems. So you gotta put heat into it twice and contribute to under firing. So here's a couple examples. Uh, we're putting it under weeping. It's the kind of thing that you would see where in the leftmost uh, diagram in, this, in the red circle, just the, that edge, just some people would call a creep, but it just, it moved. The whole thing moved. And the one in the middle, you can actually see a run. It may be hard to see all the way in the back, but it actually ran down there. And then the third one, uh, the furthest one on the right, you can see that it, it distorted the print. These would typically be classified as weeping. And generally, it's because the, you couldn't get the, the vaporized medium out of there fast enough. <coughs> So then if we look at a couple, uh, look at a couple of uh, common firing problems, the goal is to get the best properties, of course. So the same factors as the burnout step, because it's really part of the burnout step, right? Burnout happens back first and then fire. It's usually the same equipment. So you gotta manage the heat flow, and managing the heat flow means managing the air flow, because the air is what moves the heat. So decoration size, spacing of your wear, whether the, if you've got a big, you know, half a wrap and you're putting glasses uh, close to each other with, a, with the rafts facing each other, I wouldn't do that. I'd keep them all oriented away from each other if you can. Um, temperature, you know, the temperature setting, airflow, belt speed, normal conditions that you would control. And oftentimes, as I said, it's the improper burnout that you see in the firing results. Um, you can have color changes, bubbles, blisters, chips, cracks, all sorts of things. The, the bubbles and blisters actually can cause chips and cracks during, during cool down or subsequent handling. You can add this heat capacity back in, which I mentioned, and, and that can contribute to under firing because you, the trick with ceramics of any type is you, and glasses of any type is you need to get sufficient heat into it. And it's not just temperature, it's temperature and time. It's a profile. If you see these kinds of things, obviously that's gonna degrade your mechanical and your chemical durability. Here's an interesting one, of an atmosphere. Some people use gas, some people use electric. Um, and some, sometimes, I think I told a customer once I'd never seen anything that had been overfired. It's usually underfiring. That's not true. This one was overfired. This had a, uh, I believe it had a cadmium red pigment in it. And cadmiums don't necessarily like to be overfired, especially depending upon the, the furnace conditions, the furnace atmosphere. So that's the same print, basically, same ink, fired at three different temperatures. And the one on the right, you probably wouldn't like, if that's, if that's what you were making. So overfiring can wash out color, and I wanted to throw this example up, particularly for something that's sensitive to temperature and atmosphere like cadmium inclusion, cadmium type colors. Um, and it's the temperature and the oxygen that, that cause that reaction. But what we're trying to do is fully fire the glass color to get your final properties, right? You want to eliminate pores. You want to maximize gloss if it's a glossy formula. You want to get a good bond so it doesn't scratch off and develop the final color. You want a complete burnout and consolidation. That's required to get the best result. You may get something that's acceptable, but it won't be the best if it has any of those, it has any trap medium in it. You can have a decoration that looks pretty good at three feet. It may look good at one foot, and you get it really close. If it's got pinholes, you're not going to like it, but it may be acceptable. It's just not going to have the best properties it can have. So some of these, and this is a little redundant, but I organize it a little differently. So pinholes and bubbles are things that people see a lot, um, and it could be because your burnout is incomplete, you trap medium, or it could be because your upper firing temperature is not sufficient. It just means you need more heat getting into the part, time and temperature, possibly a longer burnout. You know, it may be easier to turn your belt speed down than to play with your temperatures much. Depends on, on your process. Um, gloss. If you have any cold spots in your, in your oven, in your rear, or if your process is too fast, 
you can, and you're doing a big part. Let's say you, you sprayed a browler or something, and you've got a spot that's glossy and a spot that's pretty matte. That's a that's entirely a heat issue, okay? Um, and it may not be you may not be able to make it perfect and totally uniform because a lot of it has to do with your oven <coughs> and your furnace. You know how much gradient you have in your furnace. Um, typically, by firing longer, hotter, you get more gloss in most formulations. Um, and and gloss kind of goes hand in hand with durability. You, you think of them as separate properties, but they are related. Um, if you don't get complete consolidation, if you have this increased surface area, more texture on your decoration, you're exposing more of it to whatever is chemically attacking it. So its durability is gonna go down. Plus, if you've got blisters, you're actually providing a nice, easy way for the, the chemical attack to get in. If there's cracks or crazy. So now it doesn't have to actually react and diffuse through the decoration, it goes right through a crack. It's a super highlight. <laughs> You can also have insufficient bonding to your substrate. And I guess that's, I'm sure most of you do this. When you have something come out, maybe you've just set it up for a new run or you've got mixed wear or something like that, try and scrape it off. If it scrapes off coming out of the end of your furnace, it wasn't fired. Unless it's crazed. <laughs> it has a lot of penalties. So some recommendations. Um, and again, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching the choir. Here, but um, we, we recommend you test incoming enamels versus retained material, which hopefully you order some before you run out of the last lot. <laughs> but it's really what, it's, what it is, it's an oven check. And also, you know, what Fusion and other enamel suppliers do is we're not decorators, we don't typically use leaders to do our quality control checks. We have our own standard, you know, benchmark firing process where we'll burn, you know, we, have a retained standard, we'll print samples, we'll fire them under our standard process. Our standard process isn't yours. So before you get in a new lot and go crazy and run a whole earful, run a test please, just, just to see. Because we can't test your conditions, we can only test our standard conditions. Most of the time, not a problem. Um, Wear spacing uh, and decoration orientation and fan speed. And this, I don't mean an external fan, I mean a fan in your rear, you know, moving the ventilation through. Um, the tendency is to always put stuff really close and get your density up and move it fast. And, and that's, that's, that's typical in production for any process. Um, that's where you get the best productivity. But because airflow is heat flow and, and it's critical to, to both the burnout and the firing step, um, it's really important to not, not crowd those items too close to each other. Uh, and check your ventilation and fans regularly. Sometimes um, you think they're running at full speed and maybe the fan speed is at full speed, but is the airflow, is there a blockage? Sometimes dampers move, they're mechanical typically. Double, or, well, excuse me, check, double check, triple check oven temperature. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen not only in this industry and in every ceramic industry, probes go bad. They shift positions. Um, it's usually good to have a, a couple of backups just in case. And the probes are also measuring air temperature. So we get back, they're not really measuring the wear temperature. You're assuming a wear temperature from your air temperature measurements. But, but, the, but the decoration in the, in the glass or ceramic item is at a lower temperature than your air temperature always because it's got a big heat capacity compared to the air. So if possible, with that, with that uh, caveat, try to slow down, especially if you have trouble. Slow down immediately, you know, initially, and see if that improves things. It gives you an idea that you've got a temperature gradient issue that's probably causing your problem. You know, if you go to a higher belt speed and higher loading, you need to put a higher temperature on your furnace, right? If you put a higher temperature, that means that you've just increased the temperature of your surface, but your the back end of your coating on the on the substrate, it's the same temperature it was before. It's now you've just increased that gradient and you've increased the chances of making more defects. So thanks for your attention. Um, I would be happy to take any questions or direct them to 
my colleagues that I want to thank for helping me put together the talk, who have you know decades of experience in this industry. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you.